I have previously covered the wreck of USS St. Lo. That was in my first shipwreck video on the Leyte Gulf wrecks. However, St. Lo has enough material on her wreck to justify a video of her own. In fact, she has enough material for a fairly long video. I will also note at the start here that my voice is a bit congested and I apologize for that. With that in mind, I'll cover the wreck of St. Lo in more detail this time around. First, as always, a bit of background. USS St. Lo began life as USS Chopin Bay before being renamed to USS Midway before she was even launched. That isn't unusual, especially with all the renaming going on in the Essex class at the same time. However, after spending most of her career under that name, Midway would be renamed to USS St. Lo on October 10, 1944. Now, as another case of sailors being a superstitious lot, it is generally seen as bad luck to rename a ship like that. One also imagines a bit of bitterness from the crew, especially considering the prestige of the name Midway. Which is, of course, the exact reason it was taken from her and put on the first of the next generation fleet carriers. No matter your view on that particular superstition, one can hardly argue the result. Within a month of her formal renaming, St. Lo was on the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. On October 25, 1944, the escort carrier was attacked by Japanese planes. In a shocking display of things to come, one of those planes crashed into the carrier's deck. This Zero and its bombs set fires on the hangar, where planes were being refueled and rearmed. The resulting fires and explosions sent the carrier to the bottom within 30 minutes. 113 of her crew went down with her. This is where St. Lowe's story ended as the first major victim of a kamikaze until her wreck was rediscovered. On May 14, 2019, RV Petrol and Vulcan Inc., on one of the ship's last expeditions, located the wreck. It was then surveyed on May 25th at a depth of 4,736 meters, or 15,538 feet. This is on the edge of the Philippine Trench, which is much deeper than that already deep depth. The wreck they found is, considering her violent end, in fairly good shape. Battle damage is very obvious, and there is a debris field, but the ship is in, more or less, one piece. The most notable piece missing, visible on the sonar here, is part of her flight deck. This detached at some point during the sinking, and ended up just a bit away from the main hull. Considering the short distance, it is likely this broke away fairly late into the sinking. Had it broken off early, it would have been quite a bit further away. That said, this is from the stern section. That is where the vast majority of the damage is located on the wreck. Here you can see large portions of twisted wreckage, with the area above the hull almost unrecognizable. That's bad enough because it goes to show just how bad the fire and explosion damage really was. What is almost more noteworthy here is that her propeller shafts are broken and bent to the side. You will often see these snapped off or torn from their mounts on other wrecks. It is rare to see it bent out from the ship like this. I can't think of another wreck off the top of my head with such a dramatic bend. Further damage is visible on the port side where the ship just kind of ends. Her extreme stern with the rudders and such is gone. There's nothing left but torn metal. The combination of explosions and the force of the sinking tore it away. It also seems to have torn away the propellers themselves, which is just as rare as the bending of the shafts. These are not small or light, even on an escort carrier, and it would have taken a lot of force to break them off like that. While not quite as dramatic an image, the damage does continue as you move forward along the ship. Take, for example, this shot of the hangar deck level. Here you can see a break in the hull, and, moreover, where the aft part has fallen away in comparison to the forward part. Ladders and plates are torn and broken, with what looks like a hatch hanging open on the bottom of the after end. All on its own, connected to only one part of the hull. This is also one of the areas with the most visible corrosion damage. Rust has worn holes into the metal alongside the forward end of the hull, which is a stark contrast to some of the better preserved areas of the wreck. In fact, not very far from here, you can already see the difference. 
The 20mm gun tubs on the upper level are mostly intact. The guns are missing, which is uncommon on an American wreck, but the tubs themselves are still mostly there. Right down to the paint still being intact, a few rust stains aside. In the case of these tubs though, it's something of a miracle they remained in place when you look at the damage around them. They very easily could have fallen off here. In fact, they probably will fall off as Agent Rust works at their remaining supports. While on the topic of the guns though, I'll break away from looking at the hull to focus on those. Most of St. Lowe's weapons are missing, be they the 40mm or 20mm mounts. The singular 5-inch gun wasn't photographed, which isn't terribly surprising considering the general condition of the aft hull. What is intact, however, are the gun tubs, as I mentioned. The one forward of the island is, if anything, in better shape than the ones to the aft. Other than the aircraft boom that fell on top of it, though this doesn't seem to have dented the gun tub. The second image of this tub is probably more interesting, because it shows a 20mm gun mount that is completely bare. It has no gun or gun shield, letting one see an empty mount. In fact, it is almost more interesting than seeing another intact 20mm gun beneath the waves, considering the wrecks of Hornet or Wasp possessing multiple such weapons. That said, a switch to the port side of the wreck reveals an intact gun. Well, a mostly intact gun. This 20mm cannon is pointed skyward, almost certainly a result of the rushing water as the ship sank. It becomes even more apparent when you look at the gun shields, which are bent nearly vertical. This was tough steel, and it's been bent back completely. It goes to show how violent the pressure is as a ship sinks, even in a relatively slow sinking like St. Lowe. With the last of the 20mm guns covered, though, that just leaves two sets of twin 40mm bofers. Neither of which remain in their actual position, with one resting on the flight deck and the other in the mud off the side of the ship. The first of the two on the flight deck is a fascinating image, for the gun itself and for the deck beneath it. To look at the latter first, you can see intact wood. This is not entirely surprising, at least at the depth that St. Lowe rests. The strong wood of American flight decks has typically held up pretty well on wrecks this deep. That said, it is very intact here with very little sign of actual deterioration, which marks it as better preserved than some of the hull itself. As for the Bofors guns, those are more of a mixed bag. The metal itself is in decent enough shape. Paint is still visible, though definitely not in the greatest condition. The guns haven't really rusted away either, at least towards the back. All of it good to this point. The front of the guns, however, is not the same story. Those have been bent out of shape and pushed to the side. Whatever it was that pushed the guns off the hull, it was strong enough to not just rip the weapon from its mounting, but also to bend the barrels. With the fact it landed on the flight deck, I'm inclined to go with the action of the sinking. Had an explosion done it, this would probably have landed closer to where the other one did. The second set of Bofors guns seems to be in better condition from what we can see. It is half buried in the mud, but the paint is more intact, and the barrels aren't bent out of shape. Even the gun sight rests beside it, which is impressive, considering the force it would have taken to throw this so far from the wreck. I'm almost more impressed, though, by the helmet resting at the back of the guns. I'd love to know the story of how that one, singular helmet, ended up drifting so perfectly to a rest by the guns. It's too bad that the image is spoiled by the mess on the top of the buried weapons. Even on this deep of a wreck, so far away from anything else, plastic debris has still contrived to get caught on the 40mm guns. It goes to show just how widespread plastic pollution really gets in the oceans. That said, with the guns wrapped up, let's return to St. Lowe's hull. We left off moving forward from the stern on the starboard side, so that's where we'll start again. First, just after the island itself, you can see railings bent out of place and open hatches. This isn't particularly notable if you watch my videos on Lexington and Hornet. You could see similar things on both of those ships, and St. Lowe's preservation isn't that terribly different, be it in the paint or intact railing. However, one of those hatches is worth looking at closer. You might see it already if you look closely enough. But let's take a look at when Petrol zoomed in on it. 
that reveals a crew shelter. We know that's what it is because you can see it written clearly above the entrance. This is so perfectly preserved that you could almost believe the ship sank yesterday from that plaque. Even the metal around it is, for the most part, in better shape than other parts of the wreck. The busted pipe resting in the doorway aside, for obvious reasons. Moving past this and showing more signs of visible damage, the island itself is almost as nice looking. The observation and gunnery platform on the top even still has its camouflage paint scheme, though the metal itself is bent back and over the edge of the platform. This damage is distracting, but if you ignore it and look closer, you can see some interesting details here. For example, a ladder leading into the island, which looks like the day it was last used. Not quite as nice, but still there, are instruments mounted to the side of the platform, and a siren that is still barely in place. Past this section, you have the captain's battle station. Here, various gauges and instruments remain in place and recognizable, though some are in better shape than others. It is interesting here that you can still see some of the intact writing, as well as the intact glass. It's certainly not the best looking area on the wreck by a long shot, but it's another case of visible writing on a ship that's closer to a century underwater than away from it. With nothing else to look at here though, it's back to the hull itself. I will repeat the earlier gun tub images, but this time focus more on the hull. The first thing to note is, of course, the rather obvious piece of metal on the flight deck. That's a portion of the flight deck that was torn off and came to rest on the ship just like the Bofors guns. Further evidence, if you needed it, of how violent this sinking was. Somewhat less interesting in comparison is another open hatch and the boom I mentioned earlier. The amount of intact paint is impressive though. It is, however, when you move further forward that things get interesting again. This is where visible damage comes back in, like this image on screen now. The 40mm gun director is a nice touch considering how intact it is, but the area behind it is more impressive for how broken it is. You can see where the hole drops away into a black abyss where the flight deck was torn away. And just ahead of that, Petrol found another piece of the flight deck. An inverted piece of the deck resting on top of the hull. It's difficult to make out much about it in the darkness of the deep ocean, but the fact it's inverted is pretty clear thanks to the gun tub at the front of this image. I'll note though that this rounds out the look at the upper hull of St. Low, at least on the starboard side. Before I look at the bottom of the hull again, I'll look at the port side, and then we can finish the video with the area near the mud. To do that, I'll first show an image of her one intact elevator. From survivor reports, this was apparently jammed in place by the kamikaze and the damage it caused. The result in the modern day is a gaping abyss that may or may not have the elevator at the bottom. It's hard to be sure, but if you zoom in, you can at least see some of the elevator well. The next image past that one is another one that's interesting more for the paint than for the actual part of the ship itself. While the paint is wearing away a bit and the metal is rusting to a noticeable degree, some writing is still clear as day. Keep clear during landings. As impressive as that is, I'd almost say the intact cargo netting towards the bottom of the image is more notable. I can't recall seeing that on any picture of Hornet or Lexington. That said, as you continue on to the stern, things get a bit messier. For example, a very clear break in the hull. You'll see something similar on Wasp when I get around to her, but here on St. Low, it makes it clear how bad the break is. Because the hull is bent up to a V, where the stern is pressed up against the bow. This likely happened when the ship hit the bottom, as already weakened frames broke from the strain. Whichever end of the ship hit first, most likely broke first, allowing the other part to bow out. This area on the flight deck shows similar levels of damage, with part of it completely gone. Twisted metal and broken frames are all that remain. Going back to the sonar at the start of the video, this is probably where St. Lowe's flight deck broke off and left nothing but ruined metal behind. The exposed girders on this image are more evidence in support of that, with a clear pattern of where the flight deck was torn away from its support. Moving past this, there's only one area of superstructure left to look at, or at least only one area that's still on the hull itself, that area being the island 
a small structure on an escort carrier like St. Lo. This has clear damage visible, mostly around the observation platform towards the top. The main structure itself is actually pretty intact. You can see that here, with it resting firmly in place and only showing cosmetic damage. In fact, when Petrol flew their ROV over the hull to take a closer look, it was to find an intact ladder and the entrance into the island. The ladder bit is striking for the view inside the superstructure, as well as the bent metal on the side by the ladder, which shows more visible damage than the metal around it. There's also a collection of debris resting at the bottom of the entranceway, likely a mix of interior furnishings and wood from the flight deck. Finally, a last close-up shot taken by the ROV showed the instructions at the top of the entrance, the directions to the navigator's cabin and to the captain's cabin. It's a shame we don't have an interior shot, but considering the situation, I can hardly blame Petrol's crew for not risking their ROV. Now, at this point, I'll admit this video has gone a tad longer than I expected it would. However, there are only two more things of note I want to look at. First, a piece of the flight deck in the mud. This is inverted, much like the part on the ship earlier. And just like there, the easiest way to tell is the gun tubs. Unlike that earlier image, though, you can see the internal framing and support structure. This is not a small piece of the ship by any definition. I'm not sure exactly how big, as Petrol only released a couple images of this section. But it is not exactly small, either. That aside, the second thing to look at, and the last part of the wreck for this video, is where her hull is buried in the mud. There is a strong similarity here to the wreck of Hornet. The camouflage paint is most visible on the forward hull, even with the rust streaking down it. St. Lowe's number is more faded than on other ships, but the 6 is still clearly legible, even if the 3 is very faded. However, it's only barely visible, because if the ship were buried any deeper in the mud, it would have covered up the number entirely. This is a lot of hull buried where we can't see it. This is easier to see when you look at the anchors. Here, at the extreme bow, these are resting on top of the mud, and not in the sense they fell out and came to a rest. The bow is buried so deeply in the silt that the anchors, still in place in their mounts, are resting on the bottom. I'll put an image on screen now to show how high up those anchors are when the ship is above water. Now keep that in mind as I move to a view of the very forwardmost part of the ship. Look at how deep the mud is and compare it to that picture of an escort carrier on the surface. Really drives home how buried St. Lo is, doesn't it? With that image, however, we come to an end for the wreck of USS St. Lo. I feel this is a fitting place to end. The ship sailing off into the blackness, forever hidden from prying eyes. The first victim of the kamikaze, resting silently with only deep water fish for company. As well as the resting place of over 100 brave men. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content. And I'll see you in the next one.